Okay, uh, good morning, everybody. I think it's time to start this uh, parallel session. And we'll just share my, my, my screen. I think it's there. And um, I'm happy to be here. And thank you for your time and the, your interest to this session. Uh, I think we have prepared a very interesting session for you to uh, gather things, uh, understand the current situation in the open markets, open data, open source software for the European marketplaces. And uh, we have uh, a very prestigious uh, speakers uh, that they are so busy, but they have uh, the intention to share their experiences as well with us. They're very, very keen to see here. So we have prepared this session for you uh, in three parts. Uh, one is the, the mini panel. It's, it's just kind of a, a interactive uh, session with experts to give you some insights and some uh, challenges and the situation in the data spaces, uh, interoperability, privacy, and trust, and most likely how the ecosystem uh, perspective uh, uh, from the SMEs. So it is very important to highlight that we are addressing the SMEs, uh, some main stakeholders of the, of the marketplaces, because big companies, large industries, they already have a trajectory in this area, but we will achieve the SMEs. The second part is obviously dedicated to more a technology part, uh, how reference architectures, how security, privacy, and trust by design, what are the principles of this by design concept. And also we are talking about open source projects in the context of marketplaces because there are so many alternatives now, there are so many marketplaces that uh, not many has reached the point of opening uh, this, the, 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 the ecosystem for others to, to get on board basically. And the last part will be some sort of a demonstrators or best practices in how these uh, previous two sessions can be put in practice. So the idea is to have some uh, expertise uh, from industry, some theoretical advances and also implementation advances, and then consolidate this session with these reference scenarios. And stay with us, uh, it's very, very uh, interesting session, uh, a lot of efforts to put these experts together. And let's not, uh, 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 this means this opportunity because the, the marketplaces is, is now with digital economies, with working from home, everybody. So is, is developing. Digital services are developing very strongly in late, late years. So uh, with no more preamble, uh, this is our uh, panel of expertise. Uh, also the, the, the participants in other sessions are experts, technical experts, and obviously the, the leaders in reference scenarios are there as well. So feel free to to contact any of us, uh, either the WAPA uh, app or uh, directly via an email. Uh, we, are, we are all involved in some activities in this community and we are very active as well. So uh, with no more preamble, uh, I would like to start the mini panel uh, by just saying that industrial spaces, uh, data spaces versus data marketplaces has been a, a big hype in the last five years. Uh, from developing technologies at the industry level to a more uh, SME, a incursion and incursionating on developing their own marketplaces. From individuals trying to sell and, and exchange and trade things to a more industrial space that has been projected in that. And for that one, I would like to start uh, with a question to Carolyn. Uh, Carolyn is an expert in Siemens AG for many years, and she has been in, in different departments, but the most important now is how these data spaces and marketplaces are dealing in Siemens. So Carolyn, in your view, what are the current industrial challenges for marketplaces and data spaces that we should take into consideration? Yeah, thank you, Martin. Thank you for being part of this today. I'm excited. Uh, so really the industrial challenges for the marketplaces and the data spaces that we currently see that we have to protect the sensitive data. Um, so the, the usage data, um, the product use data from the customers and our industrial data. This is really the sensitive data that we have to make sure that we protect. Uh, we also don't want to disclose the identity of the data provider. And um, so once you have a working marketplace, it's important how can I find the right data and uh, very often uh, the data is also interesting from other domains um, when you have cross-domain use cases uh, uh, that really add benefit uh, to your use case. And um, obviously the next two things are finding the right business partners. Uh, so do I have the right expertise that I need for my scenario? And how do I identify the new business models? Um, how do I really make money with data afterwards? Interesting, interesting, definitely. And this, this particular aspect on a cross-domain, because obviously many marketplaces exist and not many of them are prepared for that. 
uh, you mentioned that uh, Siemens is is also uh, involved on this one. But what are the making or the main contributions towards evolving the current data spaces ecosystems? Because the most important is to see forward and learn from the past. Uh, how Siemens is doing in this direction? Um, so there's uh, a number of projects that we have uh, in this direction. Uh, we have a small pilot uh, we're looking at. Um, manufacturing data spaces where we obviously have our uh, Siemens equipment connected uh, to our uh, MindSphere as a data space. And then we're using this uh, to make learnings. Um, this is part um, uh, of the funded project. And uh, there's other projects, for example, uh, the next big thing or big IoT uh, study, which is another um, publicly funded uh, a study from the um, BMVE. And uh, here we're looking at really how can we bridge the gap um, to internet of things and uh, create lots of services and applications with these main objectives then on top of that. How do we integrate everything? How do we share this? And then also how the marketplace needs to look like. Excellent. This seems to be a very uh, interesting initiative, uh, particularly for, for sharing knowledge, because it's, it's, tra it's traditionally large industries don't really open their, their experiences, but these two experiences seem to be very interesting. And going to the challenges, uh, what remains unsolved? I mean, what exactly you have learned in these experiences, in these projects uh, from German perspective that needs to be uh, resolved yet? Well, there's many things that we still need to solve. Um, so a lot of market spaces today are really closed ecosystems. And um, so it's uh, then you have to decide and you're just part of one. Um, there's no really trusted backbone where you can trade these data access. And obviously there's uh, not much towards standards, common API, semantic data models. And um, so this is really one of the benefits that we see when you bring a, a number of market spaces together and, um, uh, and, and then enable way more uh, than you had with just one market space. Um, the data owners need to be able to control with whom they exchange the data and um, also especially uh, sensitive data like we have in industrial use cases, like I mentioned before, this is one topic that we need to make sure that it's addressed properly. Interesting. And you're putting in the in the center of this slide a, a single marketplace, but it seems like there are different colors as well. What these colors represent in this image? A, a different, different domains or different a, a stakeholders? What exactly this a, should be learned from these a, different data spaces? Yeah, so they, they, they can be uh, different domains um, uh, of these market spaces. And the benefit is then really when I have like a trusted backbone um, that kind of connects these market spaces and then just pretty much opens the universe uh, for you and your use case, finding the proper data and partners to work with. Excellent. And you play a very, a very interesting uh, part in this like, schema because the data consumer and the data owner are in the same side. I think for the first time we are seeing that the stakeholders are in the same side for benefits, right? Uh, usually it's, it's data owners uh, ignore and only the data consumer are in the target. How Siemens is, is, is looking at this vision of uh, putting at the same level uh, the data owners and data consumers? I think that it's very, very important that you consider the whole um, value uh, creation um, in this scenario. Um, uh, so only if everybody contributes value, um, then this whole market space also has a chance uh, of working. And so that's uh, why I, I have them both on the one side. Um, they, they both want to be winners. <laughs> yeah, no, that's true. That's true. Many things to learn, obviously, from this vision and perspective from large industries. And talking about this vision, uh, Caroline, so what exactly are the properties that you can uh, advise or you can oversee over these data spaces that they must have for, for, for new developments or maybe for even maturing the current data spaces and marketplaces that exist today? Mm -hmm. 
Uh, security and privacy are, were the first two important ones. Um, obviously, that's a basis. Um, we don't want to have a central control and a decentralized system is uh, really the future. Uh, they need to be scalable, uh, interoperable, and um, so we need to be able to integrate them across uh, domains uh, with various market spaces. and. Um, one topic that I just mentioned with the uh, incentivation, you know, I need to be attractive for my uh, partners, data providers, data consumers, and everybody needs to see the value. Otherwise, um, uh, yeah, there's not much sense in joining. Mm -hmm. Right, right. So, so you have this, to, uh, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, no, so I, I just said you have to have the proper incentivation um, for everything to work. Exactly. And in, as part of this, uh, uh, let's say, properties, uh, do you see they are complementary to other uh, characteristics or these are just the, the ones that need to be now implemented? Because m some of them seems to be obvious, but obviously in this new development area of digital services, uh, market strategies, single market, uh, are they already in place or how Siemens has addressed this challenge of uh, defining these properties? Um, so with uh, security, privacy, non-centralized control, consensus-based ruling, uh, we're using uh, blockchain as the technology right. uh, of cho choice to make sure that we can guarantee this. And uh, smart contracts, uh, uh, one of the, the uh, benefits um, from, from doing this. And um, uh, other than that, it's a more uh, federated approach. Um, so. I think this is uh, how we are going to approach this. Very good. It seems like Siemens is also targeting the hype of the the evolution of technologies, so the blockchain and not, not centralized and consensus, distributed consensus. Definitely very interesting, uh, Caroline. Unfortunately, we are limited in time. Uh, we will be very happy to continue with this insight from Siemens, but we need to also give the voice to other speakers. But in case there are some questions from the participants, from the attendees, uh, please uh, type your questions on the chat. Uh, we will have a monitoring tool that we will look at the questions and hopefully at the end, if we have enough time, we can address them. Otherwise, every speaker will look at the questions and we'll send you maybe a reply via the WOVA chat or some other uh, communications to, to inform people what are precisely these, these answers for you. So as you know, this session is being recorded, so it will be also available for that. Thank you, Caroline, and uh, we will just continue with the topic. And obviously, you, you, you was mentioned the interoperability aspect and some privacy and and trust. So uh, I would like to, to address this one to Tomas Pariente Lobo. He's working in Atos in Spain, and he has a, a research team, very large expertise on these aspects. And uh, as you know, Atos is a systems integrated large company that probably uh, he can illustrate us, uh, give us a light on this direction. So uh, Tomas, uh, welcome and good morning. So talking about these properties that uh, uh, were mentioned by uh, Caroline, so can you elaborate more about interoperability? Because I think this is a crucial element that we are not probably understanding well at this point in data spaces. Hi, Martin. Uh, first of all, thank you for, for inviting me to this panel. It's a very interesting one. So let me try to answer your question. So I uh, selected this uh, painting from Goya because I think uh, it reflects uh, a bit uh, the problem with co communication that is uh, at the heart of, uh, of this uh, interoperability aspect. So as, as you see in, the, in this picture, uh, the two men are fighting each other. There's no way of communicating. They have the feet uh, buried in the ground. So they are somehow doomed to continue fighting without uh, any communication at all. So there's no agreement, there's no sharing, anything that could stop this, uh, this fight. So this, this uh, painting, uh, explain somehow why uh, interoperability, why communication uh, between people is important, but also replace these people for, uh, for instance, a couple of systems. Uh, and if you don't have any way of creating agreement, any way of, uh, uh, of communicating, uh, then they are doomed to, to go in their own ways. So interoperability in general can be defined as something like uh, a way of communicating uh, between communication between systems to exchange uh, some kind of process or some kind of data or information so the, the, this purpose is uh, is to have uh, the possibility of understanding each other for the systems the, how they pass the information from one another 
And for that, there are many, many stoppers, I would say, and many things that should be should be taken into account. And the first one, of course, is the willingness to to talk. So you cannot force people, or you cannot force, you cannot force companies to interoperate unless they have a, a benefit in mind. So this willingness is a, a very important factor in order to to to, uh, to, under, to to start interoperability and interoperability journey in the, inside the companies. So there are many, of course, many many benefits for that, and companies are aware of that. Uh, so they know that uh, in some cases they are enforced by the law uh, to, to interoperate. You can imagine, for instance, interoperability for exchanges invoices that is uh, mandatory. Or they are most probably they have some business needs or some new business opportunities on the way that uh, somehow uh, force them to do this type of interoperability uh, more willing or not. So this is important for every sector, uh, I think, and uh, and it's not an easy task to achieve interoperability. There are technical aspects that uh, some, sometimes are difficult to, to handle from an interoperability, interoperability perspective, or there are challenges related to the semantics of, this, of the, the system and the data. Uh, you can imagine different data formats, different data representations, mm -hmm. etc. And uh, of course, one key challenge is uh, the lack, or even more precisely, the scarce use of existing standards or de facto standards for interoperability, which is uh, also a, a, main, a main issue. Uh, and at the end of the day, uh, an important thing is also having a, an interoperable infrastructure behind the scenes. For instance, different cloud services that can be used uh, seamlessly by, by, the, by the different companies, etc. Very, very interesting and very complete uh, answer. Uh, it seems like a, a, it comes from different levels uh, or layers, if we want to call it like that. So data perspective, you mentioned protocols, uh, platforms in terms of exchange different protocols, uh, different communication channels. But also I was very curious on when you mentioned uh, humans uh, uh, understanding. And I think this picture is, is re really uh, uh, putting a good uh, uh, example on that. And when we go out and talking about human in the loop or human centric uh, approach, which it seems to be interoperable uh, problem as well, uh, does people trust each other? Uh, in today's data marketplaces, people trust on these uh, platforms or what is the situation from the Atos perspective in, in how this is addressed uh, from humans, right? Because we, we already, say, already saw that interoperability is, is, is a human problem as well in terms of data exchange. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, the trust is uh, probably the most important aspect to be to be taken into account when, the, when dealing with uh, interoperability in general, especially if we are talking about uh, data interoperability. So you go to the next slide, you see that uh, in the end is all about trust, basically. So trust is gained based on, on many other things. So you, you trust is uh, somehow an outcome of, uh, of having many many aspects taken into account. And mentioned here, for instance, privacy, uh, security, but uh, there are other things here like uh, fair principles, uh, data sovereignty, sovereignty. So there are many things to be taken into account in order to gain trust on uh, a specific uh, systems or specific data that come from other systems. Uh, it is very important that uh, this trust is gained. So there are many technical aspects that I, I think you will also take uh, into account in another presentation later. So I'm not going to the details of privacy aspects, etc. But of course, if you are talking about um, sensible data, sensitive data that, uh, that uh, belongs to individuals, you have to have like a, a consent. You have to have uh, a good, uh, a good, let's say, candies for these individuals to to share the data, because no no one wants to share the data for for free or for uh, or pro bono. Although in some cases it, it is also a possibility, and for companies it's actually the same. So they they want to share the data is probably because they they want also to to gain something with that. Mm, I'm not talking about selling data, but I, I'm talking about maybe. Uh, providing some uh, some ways that with this data can enhance their own business uh, in in a in a different way. So in order to gain trust, uh, you have to share, of course, uh, the right data and uh, with the right quality. Yeah, and you mentioned about this uh, value or kind of a data uh, perspective. Say, uh, what in in our current society, what are those data values that we should take into consideration uh, when we talk about when we think about privacy and trust, uh, uh, Thomas? Okay, yeah. 
So you go to the next slide. Yeah, uh, you see here that I, I put uh, three cornerstones uh, for, for the data value. And I mentioned here Europe because I think this is, uh, especially the third value is uh, very based on, the, on European values, which are uh, on, the, on the one hand, is uh, in interoperability in terms of uh, infrastructure. As you know, there are several, uh, several uh, initiatives going on in Europe in order to, uh, to allow some kind of inter in interoperability in in the, from the infrastructure or the cloud perspective. I mentioned, if you, if you click on the slide, you will see that I mentioned, for instance, uh, Gaia X uh, or uh, ITSA for data interoperability. So these aspects of infrastructure, cloud, data interoperability are key uh, in order to, uh, to, to, to somehow have a data economy. So it, it is not important for a single company, but as a whole, I think it matters. Uh, it matters. And, so it seems uh, like for having value on the data perspective, we should follow some standards or some best practices like IIX and other initiatives, right? So the, those are two, two initiatives from Europe that I think are very important. They are not the only ones, of course. There are other ways of achieving interoperability. But those are the ones that are that are hot topics in Europe at this point, I think. So it's important at least to have a, to have them in mind in order to understand what they can offer. It's not important for interoperability to to have this infrastructure interoperable, but at least it helps if you want, for instance, to to go from one system to another seamlessly. And uh, yeah, it, it it helps. So yeah, I think we should have them them in mind. Interesting, definitely very very good uh, advice and, and suggestions. And from the platform perspective, uh, uh, what exists or what are under development that you can uh, mention are, are pioneering this interoperability and privacy and trust by design? Yeah, there are, yeah, you mentioned, I think before in the, in the previous, uh, in the previous talk that there are many, many marketplaces already out there, many, many initiatives. So I think you are going also to, to talk about that later. But yeah, you can you can find many initiatives uh, around the world related to, to to data, especially and to how to to share or or how to buy or how to uh, to access to external data, because data is uh, is a good asset for for many many companies and opening a lot of uh, opportunities. So I can mention, for instance, yeah, I don't know, Sun Info for the business to business, where they offer contact records or. Uh, scan uh, online resources uh, and via APIs in order to, to enhance the business-to-business -business, uh, opportunities or Ocean Protocol using blockchain technology uh, for data exchange, uh, monetizing this via tokens. So there are many others. In this slide, I just mentioned a few that uh, we are working in, uh, uh, we are working in, in Atos. So uh, we have many, many initiatives going on in, inside our company. I mentioned here some uh, some uh, marketplaces. One of them we will talk about that later, because uh, it's uh, in the IT market in IT, uh, IT market project, which is Agora on the automotive sector. But we have also uh, what we can uh, think of, uh, such as data spaces in energy or in uh, industry. And of course, we are members of several organizations uh, that are uh, trying to deal with the, with these type of things. So and many other projects, uh, projects also in the, in, in, the, in this uh, or sisters project of IT market, for instance, such as data vaults in personal personal data uh, data data spaces or cracking in hybrid data spaces, etc. So the, we are working different different initiatives uh, from from our perspective and in different different tools. That uh, because we think that they, data is a very big uh, asset for for companies, very big asset also for for our customers. So we are trying to offer uh, different solutions and different uh, different ways of accessing data. Excellent. Thanks for this uh, summary of activities and initiatives because um, sometimes people are uh, so much involved in other projects that they lose the perspective or, or the north to where exactly these uh, initiatives can happen. And I think this uh, uh, this summarizes very well the, the initiative from interoperability perspective. And uh, what corresponds to uh, privacy and security, obviously, uh, we have prepared for you, uh, uh, everybody, in, in this session, uh, another, another part, in second part, in, in after the mini panel, that will be more specific on, on privacy, security, and trust by design. But uh, I, I would like to just say 
thanks to to Thomas because uh, he also is very busy, uh, always uh, driving projects, managing, executing, and uh, he took the time to, to prepare this material to us and and explain us the the perspectives on on this interoperability. That is always a question on the radar on, on how to achieve it. So thank you, Thomas. I I, I, I would like to continue because you know thank we you. are good accountants, uh, accountants, but. Uh, we don't have the, 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 the eternal time, but very interesting presentation, very interesting aspects. Thank you again. So I will just probably move on to the, the third uh, mini panelist participant, uh, Anika. Uh, she is obviously working in the digital SME uh, based in Brussels. Uh, I will say with the, with the full voice of uh, she represents the SMEs in Europe. And obviously the idea of uh, involving SMEs in this uh, new development for digital markets for marketplaces and other spaces uh, is a must. I mean, uh, basically, I would like to ask uh, and, and welcome Annika to tell us what exactly is digital SME representing and how do you represent these SMEs in Europe? Good morning, Martin, and good morning, everyone. Thank you for the question and also for the opportunity to be part of this. Um, European Digital SME Alliance is an alliance of SMEs in the ICT sector. So we're representing those SMEs that are actually in the ICT sector and uh, giving some examples. We uh, might represent an IT security provider, someone, uh, a company developing software solutions, but also IT consultants, also some manufacturing companies because the ICT sector is, is manufacturing and software. Um, but those are just some, some examples. And the companies we represent are SMEs, so small and medium-sized enterprises, which according to the EU definition is companies with less than 50 million revenue per year and less than 250 employees. And um, these companies actually make up, SMEs make up 25 million companies in Europe, 99% <laughs> of businesses in Europe are SMEs. And um, they, they are therefore really extremely important for our economy and the SMEs in the ICT sector that we represent are a subset of these companies, but they are not like, because um, when we talk about digital companies, like if you're not working on digital, you may know the big platform companies, but not necessarily the backbone of our economy, which are the SMEs that are providing software solutions to their business partners that are uh, maybe setting up the local IT infrastructure in another business. And we are representing these companies. So the ones that are really behind the IT, ICT development in Europe, the basis of it. Um, the last also, question, definitely, uh, Annika, I can see that you are talking about different domains, different sectors, and uh, how long these uh, uh, members uh, are involved or what commitments they have and what benefits do they get from from digital SME when they participate and when they're part of the, this ecosystem? So our network consists of the um, of 30 national and regional member associations. So they are becoming network of our uh, part of our network by joining us as an association. And the associations then um, again associate the SMEs in the local economy. And by joining this network, we really want to build up Europe's digital single market from the bottom up. So we want to help companies in Europe that are active in the ICT sector to connect and to become part of a wider network to really um, yeah, build the digital single market in, in the sense that now, of course, you still maybe have some companies that work more regionally and we want to help them to build connections. Um, at the same time, we're a business association, so our main purpose at Brussels is to represent the businesses towards the EU institutions, but also to support them in jointly developing projects and activities and to conduct networking. Awesome. And as part of these activities, Annika, um, obviously your members, uh, uh, I'm very surprised because uh, when we talk in technologies, we talk about system of systems how we interact, how we engage. And here, this seems to be a very good example of the same philosophy, but now bring it at the business level because you are talking about an association of associations. Uh, how these how this, uh, relationships or how these interactions are established? I mean, because I think this, we, we can even learn from this uh, human business world to a more technological world, how these uh, interactions are defined. 
So it's, of course, a historical process, right? So the association was funded more than 10 years ago by, um, so before my time, which is, um, but it is basically, the idea was to really uh, represent companies in the ICT sector in Brussels. And um, the, the national associations got together and established an office in, in Brussels. So, um, yeah, the idea is, I guess, to grow with the growth of, of Europe, right? So the, the um, main incentive was to, that people understood that if you have a, a representation at the national level, it's not enough anymore. You also have to combine your interests and your focus and also have an office in Brussels, because this is now where a lot of policy development is happening. <clears throat> but in terms of of course, of establishing a structure that, that works, that connects people. This is also still a work in progress from, from our side, uh, making sure that you know you have, have a good structure in place that really um, connects everyone. Yes. So interoperability here is certainly also an issue. <laughs> yes, very good. No, definitely it's a, it's, a, it's a way to understand how a proximity, how communication uh, all the aspects that we are talking in, in the previous two uh, panels with the previous two panelists uh, can be applied now at the human level. But uh, it seems like all these associations brings their own uh, ethos, right? Their own uh, ideas. Uh, uh, how this uh, can be, let's say, understood as part of this uh, preparation for Europe, because having so much diversity sometimes uh, uh, re re uh, kind of delay the process of inte integration. And because we're in a transition, to digital services, how do you see uh, based on your memberships, based on your uh, events uh, or in your interactions with the, the other ecosystems, uh, the SMEs ecosystem in Europe? Are they prepared for this, this transition? Yeah, that's a very good question. And we try to answer that by clustering the SMEs according to their digital maturity. Because indeed, as I tried to explain, we have 25 million SMEs in Europe and not every SME is, of course, the same. We have such a huge diversity and the diversity is, um, is probably better understood if you cluster them according to a certain criteria. So what we do is we say we have um, those companies that are digitally very mature. So the front runners in digital technology, they would be our members, SMEs that are developing software solutions, ICT products, um, then you have the followers that are maybe using um, tools in their core business. They're using digital tools in their core business, so they're also already quite advanced. And you also have the non-innovators, so maybe the local um, bakery, a local shop that does not really use digital technology at all, or to a very limited extent, maybe by having a website, etc. Um, so I think to answer your question, it really depends on the sort of level of maturity of the company in terms of digital and, um, and also on the understanding of where, you know, of how to use digital technologies for their business model. And um, yeah, also the, the previous slide, actually the one that you showed before, it shows that the emerging technologies are really a... Um, they can boost SME competitiveness. This is if you use technologies such as AI or blockchain in your, in your business, if it's part, if it can become part of your core business, um, if it fits with your business goals, of course, you have to see, okay, does this make sense for my business goals? Um, then you can really boost your competitiveness. But however, in Europe, we, we have low investment in these technologies. The one for AI is much lower than, um, than the venture capital for AI is much lower in Europe than in the US or China. But um, what we also indeed want to say is that the companies that we represent, the ones that are in the ICT sector, they can also be providers of solutions. So it's, it's not that the SME just has to uh, buy solutions or that they, you know, they need to be supported. No, we also have a very vibrant digital ecosystem in Europe and those companies, they, by going into business partnerships with others, they can help to transform the digital Europe's economy to a digital economy. Mm -hmm. So this is actually the, the key point. And if you do that with 
with SMEs. You also at the same time support local the local economy, and um, which is also of course very important for for Europe's social uh, yeah network or fabric. Now, now that you mentioned the the initiative of intel artificial intelligence. Uh, because today we are also talking about these uh, challenges and characteristics of new marketplaces, the new transformation towards digital services. Uh, how do you perceive, or from the digital perspective or digital SME perspective, uh, this uh, artificial intelligence uh, in Europe? Because obviously the marketplaces also need to get benefits or uh, characteristics from this AI into the ecosystem. But are the drivers, are the SME drivers of this? Uh, are we prepared for this one from the uh, perspective of European uh, industries? <clears throat> yes, indeed, Martin, we think so, because we have launched a call last year to create a focus group on AI that only consists of SMEs, and we got many applications, and we now have uh, close to 150 companies in this network of AI innovators in Europe, so it's a group that consists only of SMEs, and they are developing um, solutions in different sectors. So ranging from agriculture to manufacturing, to health, to mobility, um, to, many, to many other sectors actually. So they are employing, they develop AI solutions and then deploy them in a specific uh, sector. And some of them, so we asked them also, what are the activities you're mainly doing? And many of them were talking about data um, so doing predictive an analytics, but also uh, yeah, other types of, of course, data related uh, things, but they're also developing software themselves, so into like new um, algorithms. Um, and they are also doing consulting to other businesses. Some are working in the area of robotics, uh, natural language processing. So they're really doing a lot of different things. And, um, and then we also asked them, so what are your clients actually interested in? So how, what do your clients want from, um, from you as a business, as an AI business? And then uh, their clients seem to be mainly interested at the moment, this was last year, in, in the areas like machine learning, computer vision, um, business intelligence. So um, we also found out that for, for many of the clients, it's really important for them to improve decision-making and to improve um, predictions. So this is one of the main pull factors, let's say, from the market, why a company would want to um, invest in AI. And, right. uh, yeah. and what are the current uh, barriers, uh, Anika, from, from these uh, surveys and interactions with the ecosystem of SMEs uh, that they can see as a barrier or even drivers for AI succeed? So, so one of the barriers, we talked about it a little bit earlier, which was related to, to money, to having investment in AI, right? Like to have finance available for the companies to, if they have an innovative solution to really develop it and to go to the market and to, yeah, just attract enough uh, capital. Um, the other main point that has been mentioned uh, throughout is access to data. So I would also agree with the previous speaker that data is really an asset for, for companies. And um, our, the companies from our group also said that access to data mm -hmm. is really important, but then also talent. So finding um, skilled personal, skilled uh, staff that can develop your solutions. So these would be the three main barriers that we had identified in a, in a survey. And I think it's also echoed by larger surveys because ours is of course very small, but I've seen um, also other ones that would come to similar um, results that data is really, really important that the money, the cash is important and talent. Um, yeah, and as you see the drivers, when, when other companies want to adopt AI, it's a lot about uh, taking decisions and improving predictions and also, of course, about internal resource optimization. So how can you make things more efficient and uh, gain money from that? Excellent. Excellent. I think these are the main drivers that can uh, even illustrate us as a, as a group of uh, entrepreneurs or innovators to, to move ahead. And obviously, we understand that the, the legal framework on AI and the application on marketplaces is it still a conditional requirement? Uh, uh, what are the progress or what are the, 
the, the, the advances on, on this perspective, uh, Anika, if you can quickly illustrate us on, on how to, to address these legal frameworks. Yes, so yeah, here the slide is actually summarizing the new AI Act that was proposed by the European Commission in April. And it's of course just a proposal at this stage. So the parliament and the council would still have to approve this in order for it to become legislation. But um, it's still quite interesting to, to see how the European Commission has approached this. So they have um, defined a few areas that would have an unacceptable risk where that would be prohibited uh, from the start. So for instance, things like social scoring because um, here the rationale is that we don't want to see a society um, as in, for instance, China, where you have like a number of points and then when you do something uh, that is not in line with the public policy, you may get deducted these points and you may not have access to certain services. So these kind of uses would be prohibited, but then um, you also have areas that have maybe a higher risk, like for, for individuals, in terms of, and here one example is medical devices. And here you have to undergo an ex ante conformity assessment. Um, so there, there will be strict regulation of these high risk areas. And then other areas that are not seen as very um, risky may just have transparency obligations. So yeah, from our perspective, um, we had also of course worked with the companies from the focus group to see uh, in advance of this proposal, what they would think could be a good approach. And they had told us, okay, we we need a type of regulation that is not overburdening SMEs, right? It has to be yeah. because yeah. SMEs have less time to spend on analyzing the legal document and they have less money to pay a consultant or a lawyer to inter interpret a piece of legislation. So it has to be very clear. And um, And I think in this sense, the proposed legal framework is quite clear because you have very clear rules and you also have differentiation in terms of the risk. So this is uh, quite welcome. Of course, maybe there are some still a few things that need to be better understood as the proposal was only published in April. So we're still working on, on analyzing it and defining um, yeah, like our feedback on this. Right. And, uh, Moving ahead. Thank you, Annika, because this is really a, a very good uh, overview on what exactly AI will uh, uh, be moving on. And uh, with this context of uh, data spaces, uh, single data marketplace, and obviously data economies, uh, digital strategies, all these things th needs to be uh, settled in AI Act uh, to be compatible. And uh, uh, unfortunately, we don't have too much time for this mini panel. Uh, we are just over the time. Uh, if you have questions, participants, please just type in, in, the, in the chat. Uh, I would like just to invite the mini panelists, participants, to just open your camera just to say goodbye, everybody, and, and really appreciate your time and your interest in this participation. And obviously, uh, stay online uh, if you want to continue uh, the sessions. Uh, we invite you to stay. You're very welcome. And uh, just I would like to maybe transition this mini panel that has been very rich in information to a more a focus a, a pan, a kind of a participation in terms of a market technologies, a op, particularly open markets. That is something that has not been probably discussed properly in Europe. But uh, for this one, we have three speakers, a large expertise in different elements of different parts of the opening markets. Uh, Ivan, from, Ivan Martinez from Atos, a, a senior a software developer and also a team lead in, in developing technologies. Alessandro Micone from GFT, large industry, well-known in privacy, security, and trust uh, initiatives and solutions, systems integrator company, and also Achille Sapa from the National University of Ireland with large expertise in, in, in uh, open source software, a large a number of projects on uh, delivering open source uh, platforms, etc. cetera. So uh, the, the, now the formats are a bit different. So they will have uh, uh, 10 minutes each to present their ideas, their progress, uh, including questions and answers. Uh, maybe, uh, Ivan, uh, you're the first one in the line, so you can just address the, the your presentation by trying to give something to take uh, will be probably the best message because uh, working in virtual worlds, uh, we don't have this interactive tool to, to open the questions to the floor, but uh, let's try to do our best to try to answer the questions that you have, your team have, and now you have addressed and you have answered. 
I will probably just stop my screen because you can share your screen, Ivan, mm -hmm. and then uh, we're gonna start. Yeah, sure, Martin. Yeah, first of all, thanks, uh, thanks, uh, Martin, for for inviting me to this uh, to this uh, session. And yeah, let me try share my my screen now. Yeah, I think Martin, that you, you should stop your uh, stop sharing. Good, we can see uh, you can just go in presentation mode and your time will start as soon as mm -hmm. you enter. Now okay. you have 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, thanks. Thanks, Martin. Yeah, let me um, let me start this uh, short presentation, uh, quite quite focused on, on the topic of, of the reference reference uh, architecture in, in the context of the uh, data data market solution. Uh, well, um, but uh, I would like to, to start introducing the, the, the concept of, of reference uh, architecture, uh, talking, uh, talking the, the, following, the following definition. The reference architecture is, is an authoritative source of information um, about um, uh, a specific subject, subject area that guides and constrains the instantiation of uh, multiple uh, architecture solutions. Yeah, if, if we examine it and analyze the, the existing reference architecture definition, a common term, a common point among the, the, the definition is that the, the primary purpose of our reference uh, architecture is to guide and constrain the instantiation of solution um, solution architecture uh, has, has a peak in, in, the, in, the, in the picture slide. And uh, based on, on this, um, our reference uh, architecture is, is considered uh, an organizational asset uh, providing uh, common common language for the various stakeholders, uh, providing consistency of implementation of, of, the, of technology to solve uh, problems, supporting the validation of solution uh, against uh, proven reference uh, uh, architecture, uh, and finally encouraging adherence to uh, common standards, specification, and um, uh, patterns. Yeah. Um, well, uh, whether if you plan it or not, every piece of software goes through um, through a similar path from from the idea to to the to, to launch day. Uh, collectively, the step of this uh, uh, path are, are called to the um, are called the, the software development lifecycle or or is the DLC for for short. The the S uh, DLC is the sequence of steps that take place during the the development of, of a piece of, of software of software sorry uh, in concrete the uh, uh, the waterfall so, uh, software uh, development process uh, is one of the oldest and, and most traditional model for for building software uh, in, in, in this in in his most basic basic form uh, you can think of, of the waterfall method as uh, following uh, each step of the SDLC in in in, sec, in in sequence, sorry. Um, however, uh, in in most practical application, the phases overlap slightly when uh, feedback and, and information being being passed uh, between them. And uh, speaking uh, about the different phases in in the in the in the waterfall, we find the the planning requirements, uh, system and software designs, uh, implementation, testing, uh, deployment, and finally uh, maintenance. Um, Finally, uh, we could say that the, this uh, the, the waterfall model, the, the waterfall is is uh, is uh, for for teams with uh, with rigid rigid uh, structure and, and uh, documentation uh, documentation needs. Uh, well, the uh, let me move now to the to the agile design process, and and here we could say that the the, the agile software. Uh, uh, development process and its uh, most uh, popular uh, methodology is Scrum, opt uh, for uh, an iterative and, and dynamic approach for for uh, to, to to development. It has opposite to the waterfall process street sequence of flow, 
in, in agile uh, cross functional uh, teams working in sprints of two weeks to two months more or less to build and release usable uh, software customers for feedback. Mm, in terms of, of phases uh, in, 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 in a scrum, uh, we find the, the product backlog, the sprint backlog, the sprint design and, 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 and develop, the release uh, working software, um, the feedback, uh, feedback and validation, and finally the planification of the following sprint, uh, the, the, the next sprints. And finally, we could we could conclude saying that uh, the agile, uh, agile design process is, is for dynamic teams doing uh, continuous uh, updates to, to, to product. Well, uh, speaking about the um, architecture specification methodologies, um, I would like to speak um, uh, about the uh, 4 plus 1 uh, view model. Uh, which, which is used for uh, describing the architecture of software uh, of software system based on uh, the use of, of multiple uh, concurrent concurrent views. The views are used to describe the system from the uh, viewpoint of uh, different stakeholders such as uh, end users, developers, system engineers, and, and, and project managers. The four views of the model are logical development process and, and, and physical physical view. In, in addition, uh, selected use, use cases or, or, or scenarios are uh, used to illustrate the architecture serving as uh, the, the, the plus uh, plus one view. Uh, hence, the, the model contains uh, a four plus four plus one view. Uh, in concrete, the logical view is, is concerned with uh, with the functionality that the system provides to, to the end user. The process view uh, deal with the dynamic uh, aspect of, of the system, explain the, the, the system processes and how they, they communicate and, and focus um, on the runtime behavior of, of, the, of the system. Uh, the development view uh, illustrates a system from a, develop, a developer uh, perspective and is concerned with, with the software man uh, management. Physical view depicts the system from a system, a system engineer point of view. And finally, the last view, the scenarios, uh, provide um, a complementary view, a, a new view of the architecture using uh, a small set of, of uh, use cases. Well, uh, I would like to uh, speak just, just a little uh, uh, to the, um, the most common common standard uh, reference architecture and, and reference model relevant for for the uh, uh, big data big data domain and here we, we find uh, in my opinion three three excellent uh, example the nix and the gaia x and, and the bdb uh, bdb uh, reference reference model uh, in concrete, the, the NIST uh, reference architecture is organized around five five major roles and, and multiple sub roles aligned along two axes uh, representing the, the, the two um, uh, big data value chains, information value at uh, the horizontal axis and, and information technology in the, in the vertical axis. Um, uh, the, regarding to the Gaia X, uh, we could say that the Gaia X ecosystem has a, a wall, is, is structured into uh, a data ecosystem and, uh, and the infra infrastructure ecosystem. The activity in the infrastructure ecosystem is, is focused on, on providing and consuming infrastructure services, uh, which, is, which in, in, in Gaia X are, are representing uh, primarily by by asset uh, call call node in the data ecosystem the main asset is the is the um, is the data and the uh, architecture support um, and, and enables uh, data spaces and build advanced uh, uh, let me say um, uh, smart services in, in high industry verticals yeah and finally the bdb reference model may serve as uh, a common reference uh, framework to uh, locate Big data technologies at, on the on the overall uh, IT IT stack. Um, it uh, addresses the main concerns and, and aspect to, to be considered uh, for the big big data value value system. And the the, the, the BDV uh, reference model is structured into 
uh, horizontal and vertical concerns. The horizontal concerns cover a specific aspect along the data processing chain, uh, starting with the data, data collection and, and injection, and extending to the uh, data visualization. And finally, the vertical concerns address cross-cutting uh, issues uh, which may affect all uh, horizontal horizontal concerns. Yeah, and to conclude my my presentation, I would like to uh, speak uh, about the concrete uh, uh, reference architecture and, and implementation that we, we are already released in the context of the i3 market uh, project. Um, applying all the principles introduced in, in previous slides, we, we have already released a first version of i3 uh, market reference uh, architecture and, and implementation. Um, we could say that uh, i3Market is um, an innovative approach through, uh, towards uh, federating, uh, improving interoperability and, and scalability in present and future uh, data market. let me say, with uh, software tools for trust, security, and, and data protection. Um, the the main entity behind the the i3 market reference uh, reference architecture it is the the backplane defined as a as a software that provides the, the lacking technologies for trust interoperable and, and decentralized market spaces for for uh, the the industrial data and has has the picking in the future uh, to achieve that goal the reference architecture include the, the following assets the three data market uh, platform, Agora, MindSphere, and, and IBM data platform, that will be um, operational during the project life, life cycle, allowing the data providers and consumer to register and, and sign up uh, via subscription and secure uh, access, identification, and offer or consume data in, in a protected manner. A secure data access API that enables the data data providers secure registration and, and consumer verification to access and or um, assign data in, in, a, in a peer to peer fashion. Uh, once the, the contract and, and security mechanisms for um, identity, identity management have been uh, confirmed and, and executed. Uh, uh, the, the, the reference um, architecture e, e, e provides a, a marketplace API for uh, all the communication between the data providers and, and data, data consumer to the, to the marketplace. Uh, in addition to this, provides a set of uh, IoT-related vocabularies and, and data models to semantically describe the data, data offers and, and demands. And finally, Mm, ref, the ref, this reference uh, uh, architecture um, includes, uh, let me say, uh, a, a set of intelligent services for data monetization defined first for, for from the pricing model to, to the provider of, of the data, assigned and, and second uh, by the activity and, and interaction in the marketplace following dynamic pricing pricing models. Yeah, and yeah, that's all. Thank you very much, Ivan. I think that's very, very interesting how from reference uh, designs, uh, standards, and let's say architectures, uh, you have built this IT market reference and now it's ready to to, to go. So it's, it's, it's a very good practice. And mm -hmm. I think we'll not be the only one, but if this example can replicate other ones by following these standards, will be the way for Europe to move ahead in this open market platform, mm -hmm. uh, data spaces, marketplaces. So thanks, Ivan. Uh, I we will move directly to the presentation from Alessandro. So Alessandro, if you can share your screen and uh, go ahead with your time. Uh, actually, uh, Ivan did very well, so uh, 10 minutes and, and 20 seconds. So if you can keep it in between the 10 minutes as well, Alessandro, would be appreciated because uh, I, I think your message will be very, very rich as well. So please go ahead. Okay. Thanks, Martin. Just a moment. In the meantime, uh, participants, if you have questions to Ivan, just type it in the chat and uh, we will try to, uh, if we have time, resol resolve it at the end, or if not, we will address them directly to, to you via the WOBA or other emails chats.
Okay, sorry, I have some problems. Okay. Um, Okay, let me know if you see the presentation in presentation mode. Yes, Alessandro, please go ahead. Okay, okay. Thank you. Uh, I introduce myself uh, briefly. I, my name is Alessandro Micone. I'm a project manager from GFT Italy, and uh, I'm involved uh, in a European project like iFree Market and also Market Innovation Project, uh, uh, mainly based on uh, blockchain and, and digital identity. So the main topic uh, we we see uh, in uh, this discussion is, is data sharing. The, the actual main topic is data sharing because in the last years, uh, big data management and uh, artificial intelligence uh, had a great progress and uh, permit us to collect a lot of uh, uh, a lot of useful data and analyze them to to drive uh, our business. But uh, uh, how we can find other useful data outside our organization and how we can share our data uh, with uh, other organizations in a secure and a protected way. Data marketplaces are uh, first uh, answer to this question, but uh, at this moment uh, they are a closed ecosystem. And uh, so um, our uh, goal is, uh, is to um, create and improve the, uh, the network, the connection between uh, uh, this data marketplace. So the goal of uh, iFree Market Project is uh, to overcome the technological barriers and provide the necessary level of uh, trust, security, and privacy uh, to improve data sharing between the data marketplaces from uh, different countries and uh, and contexts. We said that uh, iFree Market uh, provide uh, trust, security, and privacy by design because uh, we um, analyze them uh, and addressing them uh, during the design phase because uh, together with the semantic uh, interoperability, uh, these are the main pillars uh, of uh, our our project. So, for example, we can uh, we can see requirements uh, for trust, security, and privacy that we analyze and uh, address. Uh, so, for example, for the trust, uh, uh, we have transparency and tamper proof for accountability, no repudiation, and also security and privacy. So, for the security. We have to address authentication authorization, but also data integrity and data availability, and uh, also in this case, accountability and all repudiation, and also the, the privacy. And finally, for privacy, uh, we have uh, some requirements mainly related to GDPR. So for example, user-centric, data minimization, user consent, pseudonymization, secure data transfer, and accountability. So uh, we design to address these requirements. Uh, we design our architecture with specific building blocks uh, that provide uh, themselves uh, this feature by design. So for example, uh, we use uh, blockchain, crypto wallet, and smart contracts uh, in order to uh, give transparency and uh, uh, tamper proof uh, um, and also um, security in the uh, on-chain uh, operation uh, because blockchain is a distributed ledger uh, so any stakeholder participating in the chain could uh, uh, check uh, and uh, verify blockchain operation the blockchain uh, uh, consensus algorithm uh, doesn't permit uh, to uh, create transaction um, uh, that are not uh, in line with the blockchain currency to send history. So data integrity uh, is uh, provided and also tamper proof because uh, uh, no one can uh, can change uh, uh, 
transaction recorded in the blockchain without the consensus of, us, consensus, uh, of uh, all the, the blockchain uh, nodes. Um, but not uh, all the transactions that are recorded in blockchain, so we add uh, a component, uh, auditable accounting component that records um, uh, the transaction and data uh, of chain, but uh, backup them uh, in the blockchain uh, so we, we can uh, have the um, uh, security uh, that uh, all the data recorded in the auditable accounting is, uh, um, is, is real, is, uh, is proved. Uh, then to complete the trust uh, uh, requirements, we add a verifiable a component to managing verifiable credential because uh, uh, verifiable credential are uh, um, credential that could uh, uh, that are signed by the, the issuer and, and uh, it could uh, verify by all the stakeholder uh, participating in the network. Uh, so um, through the cryptographic, uh, elements provided by the crypto wallet we can sign this credential and uh, we can provide uh, uh, to all the stakeholders involved the mechanism to to check uh, this credential in, in an independent way so we can we can trust uh, the information provided by uh, the other stakeholder the other users of, of uh, participating in the network then we uh, add uh, to the architecture uh, component uh, managing the identity access management to complete uh, the security requirements and uh, the other component involved uh, in this part uh, are of course the crypto wallet and blockchain uh, for the um, for the on-chain uh, operation uh, and uh, and also the auditable accounting for the, the off-chain operation and the verifiable credential because uh, our identity access management system is based on verifiable credential uh, checking so we, we don't have a central identity and access management but a distributed access identity access management that uh, check the verifiable credential provided by the user and uh, uh, give the uh, the authorization, uh, authenticate the user and give the uh, related authorization. Finally, to complete the privacy requirements, we provide, uh, we implement the sovereign identity paradigm. So um, we um, uh, permit the user to own their uh, personal data and uh, share it uh, uh, with uh, only with their consent so when uh, a user uh, interact with the system uh, with a, a data marketplace for example uh, using uh, our uh, system our iframe market backplane um, the the user could uh, share uh, his data, but maintain the, the control uh, over over his data. So all the personal information and verifiable credential issued by the other stakeholder are uh, stored in the crypto wallet uh, associated uh, and owned by by the user, and. Uh, so uh, no personal data are stored in the uh, stakeholders in, for example, data marketplaces uh, uh, database because uh, all this information are owned by the uh, user and shared uh, in, uh, in, the, in the right moment and uh, in the right way, providing only the, the necessary information. So. Uh, with the self-sovereign identity, we can address the user-centric uh, requirement and also data minimization and the uh, user consent requirements uh, requested by GDPR and, and privacy by design uh, paradigm. 
um, for uh, to implement this uh, uh, building block we analyze uh, the technology um, state of the art technology and we choose uh, um, the suitable technology uh, to 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 implement this this building block and for example we choose the hyperledger bezu blockchain uh, and uh, we choose uport uh, um, technology to develop uh, to provide the verifiable credential and self sovereign identity uh, features and uh, dumb language to um, to develop uh, uh, smart contracts with the uh, the rules uh, of uh, uh, of the uh, uh, network and the rules uh, of the data sharing uh, uh, between data provider and data consumer and uh, for the um, identity access management uh, we choose uh, uh, key clock uh, which is uh, an OAuth 2 and OpenD connect uh, uh, identity access management system and uh, uh, integrate uh, the uh, the U port with U port library integrate the self sovereign identity verifiable credential features in a, a open ID a connect provider identity provider so uh, we we can uh, um, permit the authentication of the user uh, using the self sovereign identity and verifiable credential features but uh, um, in, in a standard way in a standard open ID connect way that is the most uh, uh, use the standard to to authenticate uh, uh, towards um, an external an external provider uh, so we then we add uh, um, implement our own uh, crypto wallet uh, which is an electron application and uh, provide a software wallet uh, but uh, also uh, we can connect uh, an other wallet to improve uh, security and to so we can record the uh, cryptographic key the private key uh, controlling the wallet uh, in uh, in an hardware and so to to make it uh, more secure and uh, finally we implemented the loopback application for the auditable accounting which used truffle to interact with blockchain to backup data to the blockchain and uh, a non-repudiable uh, proof library to create a signed proof uh, uh, about the, the data sharing uh, between the data provider and data consumer uh, so uh, all these components are uh, part of the um, uh, network node the, that uh, uh, that is distributed over uh, all the stakeholders of the network. So, for example, any data marketplace has a, um, a deployment of this uh, component, <clears throat> and so can interact with uh, with the blockchain authenticated user uh, using the referable credential uh, paradigm and uh, provide the crypto wallet to his users uh, um, account uh, of chain information with the little accounting and uh, provide the smart contacts to uh, to create the, um, the, the 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 rules uh, of uh, data sharing uh, that are uh, automatically executed when uh, um, data provider and data consumer uh, sign these smart contracts and uh, uh, operate uh, data transfer between uh, in a peer-to-peer -peer, uh, mode. So finally, uh, uh, these are some examples of uh, GFT success stories in which we uh, create a, a network between uh, different stakeholders based on blockchain, crypto wallet, and smart contract. All these projects are a token reward uh, um, system 
uh, in which uh, an, uh, an, enab an enabler, uh, a specific uh, stakeholder, engage uh, other business entities and then the users in order to create a strong business uh, relationship and uh, reach a common goal. Uh, for SDG community, for example, the goal is to improve uh, sustainability through the connection of uh, business entities, which aim to incentivize virtual behaviors related to sustainable development goals uh, defined by uh, United Nations. Sorry, and uh, you can conclude. It will be yes, good. yes, yes. And use the, the carbon footprint. And uh, for smart chain, uh, the goal is to improve the local tourism through the connection between local tourist operators and other local businesses. And finally, for in cooperazione, the, the goal is to improve the local economy through the cooperation between uh, uh, different uh, business uh, um, cooperatives operating different uh, business sector like social services, credit, uh, agriculture, and supermarket. That's all. Thank you. Okay, so just just uh, after I announce it. So thank you, uh, Alessandro. I, I think uh, you have done a very good job on uh, introducing the by design perspective and how it's implemented. And obviously, your vast experience on this uh, field is is very well reflected. Um, let's move on into the next uh, part. Uh, sorry, the next presentation of this part, uh, which means open source, and we will tie together the three main aspects: architecture, references. A privacy, security, and trust by design, and obviously open source, and how these three things uh, can uh, put together, because that's the main objective of this second part of the session. Akile, are you ready? Please uh, share your screen, and you have uh, less than 10 minutes, but let's see how you can do with that. Yeah, please, uh, Alessandro, can you stop uh, sharing? Uh, yes, okay. Okay, so. You can see my, my screen. Yes, uh, you can go uh, presentation mode will be better. Yeah, actually, okay. Thank I'm you. trying to, to be quick and uh, just giving an uh, overview of the concept of uh, open source uh, and the project and what are the, the challenges and the definition. I'm Achille Zappa from the National University of Galway in, uh, in Ireland. Uh, okay, when uh, usually, the open source commonly refer to software and especially that use an open development process and uh, as a specific licenses and include uh, uh, distribution with uh, source code and the code that is made uh, freely available for uh, all the possible modification redistribution and used by the community uh, in, a, in a, an open way. There are different types of dimension and the scope in open source uh, software development related to different types of uh, system and uh, applications. One of the main, uh, uh, the main characteristic of uh, open source uh, distribution and software is that uh, we have uh, a, an open uh, type of uh, distribution of the, the asset that we want to, to share with the community that is uh, accessible to anyone and at uh, any time. So that is uh, for one of the main point is the accessibility of uh, the, the software, but also the documentation and all the information that are related with the process and the type of uh, uh, progress that is ongoing uh, related to the development of the, of the software. That is uh, supported over time by the, the main uh, developer, but also by the, the other people that want to engage with the continuous training, establish communication with the community and engagement, mm -hmm. make it everything reusable and able to be uh, user uh, change and uh, integrated outside the, the initial scope. And uh, uh, where the main uh, part that is related with open source uh, software and uh, asset are the licenses that are used to define this open source uh, project. 
because uh, it's very important to have uh, this concept of uh, open source licensing to emphasize the fact that uh, uh, here you have this concept of force or force that is freely by open source uh, licensing uh, uh, process where the free software refer to freedom to use uh, and not always related to the price because there are different concepts. Licenses uh, are distribution term for software that are necessary because the software is anyway uh, protected under copyright law. Using open source uh, process, uh, you are opening also line of communication and you are keeping uh, growing in development uh, ideas at this process of uh, around uh, the open source product that you want to develop. Uh, it's very important the uh, knowledge of the transparency and distribution strategies that are a um, better approach uh, where uh, root of uh, tasks that are concerned or related with the software that you want to use. And the transparency is inherent in every release of open source uh, code. This way, we can see that openness and transparency have uh, uh, helping building a better result and the community around the different solution that you are promoting. You need this way to understand what type of licenses you want to, 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 to use that uh, can include uh, more like a uh, uh, writer relinquished or the more writer retained. Depend on the, how you want to, to propose the, the software and how you want to, to make uh, this uh, available also for a commercial uh, purpose at the end. You need to understand what are the compatibilities between the different uh, licensing because you always need to, to understand what are the dependencies of the single part of the software that you are using to be able that at the end of the final license that you are using is compatible with the library or other pieces of software that are integrated in your product. Especially when we talk about uh, derivative uh, uh, work that is related with the use of your open source project. Uh, try to understand that uh, also the European Union is uh, very um, keen to understand what is this process and there was uh, the, this idea to create uh, a UPL that is a, a, a force license uh, uh, created by the European Union to as an example of uh, open source uh, license and always take in consideration what are the copyleft rights that are related with different type of dependencies of your process that could implicate the, the use of the open source uh, software after by the uh, final user, especially in uh, commercial purpose. And uh, there is a strategy that uh, also is used in uh, our market to understand that, so what is the the plan for creating all the open source solution and make it uh, available, starting with the governments that is related with the, the study and the strategy around the licensing of every single piece of the software and product artifact and how the integration culture related with the, the, the environment where is uh, this uh, uh, asset uh, product and software uh, shared for example, like uh, repositories, the real type of asset, so a piece of code, source code, uh, libraries, uh, documentation, know-how that are related with the, the, the product that are exposed and make uh, available to the community. And the engagement and creation of the community itself that is around the user of the, 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 the open source uh, software, but also the, the engagement with people that, that can help to 
uh, improve, optimize, and extend the software for specific type of use. And uh, in this case, you need to create what is the way to make it available uh, in a better way to uh, engage with people, uh, try to create the, the, the environment and the community and make it uh, everything clear and understandable in a way that you, you need to have a different type of release, uh, the coordination of the, the software and the community, the un type of announcement, uh, how we, if everything is made available to the, to the community to be user, understand it, and uh, tested. And the cooperation later with the type of uh, step that we can use to, to extend or optimize the process in a different type of uh, domain. So I think that uh, try to be quick, but try to, to cover all the different aspects. And uh, thank you for the process, uh, just to understand that we try to have a, a different type of release or software care to market to extend over time at the, the optimization and the extension of different uh, software. Excellent, Akile. Thank you very much, and thanks for your uh, reduction in time. Uh, I think we just move ahead with the last part of the session. Uh, it's only three videos that we would like to to show you uh, the, the leaders of this uh, of these pilots or, or this project, the videos are are here. So they can pitch the, the video. Akile, you can play the first one. Uh, in the meantime, uh, Raul, pitch the video. The intention of these videos is basically to, to show you uh, a, a way to go in terms of implementing this uh, uh, standard ways, uh, open source techno te techniques or strategies. And of course, the reference uh, implementations that has been discussed today. Uh, Raul, are you ready for the pitch? Uh, Akile, can you play the, the first uh, video? You, you need to, to just uh, pitch uh, quickly because the video has sound. So I share also the sound. Okay, perfect. The video, yes, yes, the video is, is prepared <laughs> to, to be explanatory itself. And just uh, to thank you for uh, the invitation uh, for this video. And uh, just go ahead. Hello, and welcome to the Automotive Data Marketplace presentation. In the data world of the automotive sector, Atos provides the Agora Data Marketplace, which will be integrated into the E3 market backplane. Agora brings data supply and demand together and provides the possibility of efficient matchmaking through an open and brand independent platform. Even though Agora is initially targeted to vehicles and home building information, it can also be implemented in several vertical markets. At the moment, we come with data from smart cities and mobility market. The automotive pilot focuses on the integration of a functional marketplace, Agora, within a three market. As a fully operational standalone marketplace, Agora will integrate directly with the E3 market backplane, making direct use of the SDK core provided and the OEDC library. The net outcome is gaining presence in several vertical markets. From connecting to the market, Agora is reaching the manufacturing and the smart health markets. From the development of the marketplace itself with the gains of e market connection, Agora also offers data to insurance companies through the connection with the smart fleet from the Infinitech project. Agora is going to use the services provided by e market to improve its functionalities. The identity provider component is OIDC standard and provides access to a personal identity wallet. Agora will make use of a smart contracting component for one-to-one -one contracts based on specifics of its data asset request and stakeholder. Data access component ensures the quality of service and data access management. The semantic engine provides Agora interoperability between any type of marketplaces or data spaces, knowledge to open the CIEDM or and collaborate with other standards. As a result of the integration, Agora will be more efficient and reliable and attract more manufacturers and service providers to trade their data. The scenarios of the automatic pilot involve the management of fleets and the provision to insurance companies. Taking advantage of the improvements powered by e Market, Agora will offer to smart fleet the possibility to ingest more amount of vehicle data from several OEMs providers as well as open data portals. AI algorithms from service providers 
are powered with data to continuously enhance the quality and preciseness of the service offer on top of that, like pay as you drive, pay how you drive. Therefore, Agora will enhance the analytics and AI services offered by SmartFleet by pushing more vehicle data to AI services. Agora will learn from the use of the semantic engine provided by i3 Market and use it to extend the CIDM with the new needs and specifications. This knowledge will then be used to contribute in the FIWER and the ACLD model. Thank you for joining and giving us your attention. If you have any doubts or wants to know more about Automotive Data Marketplace, please feel free to contact us. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Raul. So we go to the next one. Yeah, I will go with the well-being pilot term. That is Rafael's case. The well-being data marketplace interacts with two other marketplaces using the i3 market backplane. Well-being applications monitor and coach people in a standardized fashion. For example, ambient assisted living for elderly, worker safety for firefighters and coaching of people with chronic diseases. For an elderly, it is important to live in a familiar environment without causing too many problems or too large costs for caregivers and relatives. Monitoring helps to prevent severe consequences of accidents. Standardization allows extension to other well-being applications like safety of firefighters and coaching of people with chronic diseases. Well-being applications monitor a data owner that can be an elderly, a patient, a worker, or an athlete with biometric or contextual sensors. Sensors enable documentation of performance, prevention of safety critical situations, and much better coaching. A service is provided by a doctor, caregiver, firefighter captain, workplace supervisor, or team coach with the help of assistants, relatives, or colleagues that receive alerts. Providing readiness information is less critical from a privacy point of view, but could save lives of 50 firefighters annually. Well-being applications have one single goal, improve quality of life and reduce risk of customers. Such applications got a boost during the COVID pandemic. Building a monitoring system needs many components. One, design sensing principle and sensor. Two, build sensor acquisition platform. Three, develop data transmission tools. Four, build cloud infrastructure. 5. Pre-process data, 6. Extract activity of daily living, and 7. Relate activity of daily living to health and behavior. Finally, 8. Compare with cohorts and trigger alerts. We have demonstrated such a system as part of the four-year ActiveAge European project, composed of the components in the home, a server infrastructure, and a cloud infrastructure providing service for stakeholders. The figure at the bottom shows a sleep pattern of an elderly over a one-year period with intermissions from hospitalization and vacation. Building well-being solutions from scratch is difficult, time-consuming and expensive, and was only possible for large data gathering companies. i3 Market now accelerates applications, combining sensors from diverse companies. GDPR rules hamper fast R&D use of data, but as a short-term fix, data exchange is initially limited to simulated data until ethics and GDPR problems are solved. The functions that are needed are registration and access with well-defined access rights and well-defined limited access parameters. The well-being portal then lists data sources, metadata, and viewing of available data. To build solutions, interesting datasets can be found via the i3 market backplane. And in order to provide additional opportunities for return on investment, datasets can be offered for secondary uses given user consent is available. For questions, please contact Bruno Michel at IBM Research Europe Zurich. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. I think Bruno is okay. also online and uh, thank you for this illustrative video, Bruno. Let's go for the next last one. Yeah, I will go with the manufacturing graph from uh, email. So. The manufacturing graph. 
manufacturing data marketplace is one of three pilots and demonstrates the capabilities of i3 market in the following we provide a short introduction Availability, transparency and access to data are key factors for success in the connected economy and largely determine competitiveness. This quote from Platform Industry 4.0 shows the value of data for manufacturing companies. There are numerous ways to make use of data in this environment. Our manufacturing data marketplace enables access to data within a manufacturing ecosystem. We address two scenarios with an ice cream market. The first one deals with maintenance services for production machines. Preventive maintenance is a key factor for avoiding unplanned downtimes and disturbances of production. However, maintenance of production machines is not a key competence of the manufacturing personnel. So, What's the easiest way for a factory operator to find a maintainer for his machines? The operator can just create a maintenance request in the manufacturing data marketplace and publishes data of his machines via the marketplace, operational and descriptive data. A maintenance provider can access the data via the marketplace, can check the data and may create a quotation for the maintenance of these machines. Finally, the factory operator can accept this quotation and contract the maintenance provider. The second scenario addresses the optimization of production machines. A machine optimizer needs real data of machines in factories to train the machine algorithms based on this data. But how will he get the sensitive data? This is a chance for a factory operator who can offer real machine data. Interesting data could be consumed energy, temperature values and all other sensor data that could be used for analysis. The factory operator therefore creates a data offering in the manufacturing data marketplace. The machine optimizer discovers this offering, accepts and pays and gets streamed machine data in exchange. Finally, the machine optimizer can start optimizing the machine algorithms based on this data. To extend the ecosystem, the manufacturing data marketplace is integrated in i3 market and uses the common services that i3 market supports. This integration provides access to data consumers and providers of all marketplaces in i3 market by profiting from the benefits that i3 market provides trust fairness interoperability and compliance with the european general data protection regulation in case of any questions about this marketplace please feel free to contact us siemens ingenuity for life all right thank you very, thank you very much Achille and uh, everybody so we have just one minute to Kind of a wrap up. Uh, I got this permission from our organizer. Um, uh, just to say uh, thanks again for everybody to attend. Uh, obviously, we have seen today uh, different aspects uh, from general views, uh, requirements, uh, prerequisites to start your own projects in in data marketplaces. Uh, lessons learned uh, to more like applications and how industries and how SMEs are addressing those challenges and requirements. And we also see a summary of videos that can reflect that it's possible to do with open source technologies like IT Market and other projects like Agora, uh, Mindsphere, etc. So all this, uh, I think, is a, is, a, is a good summary of activities. Uh, there are some other open open issues as well in the security part and the the interoperability parts, and we are still working on these areas in the communities, uh, in data spaces, and uh, trying to open this uh, to the communities, right? And as Achille mentioned before, openness does not necessarily mean uh, open your interfaces or for free. So there are licenses, there are, there are permissioning uh, uh, documents or, or doc electronic documents that can allow these uh, commercial interactions even. So uh, I think you, you agree with me that it was a very rich session. And uh, hopefully when we provide the videos and the slides, you can get more insights on this one. Uh, there were kind of a couple of questions that are still in the chat. So we will try to address them directly from the presenters to you and we will reply via the WOVA 
in terms of uh, um, uh, short responses, right? So my my really appreciation to the to the participants, my appreciation to the uh, speakers and panelists. Uh, we will keep working on these areas, and hopefully, we will see in future events and just keep tracking the activity on data spaces, data marketplaces, and the project that we we, we presented today. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, uh, and have a good. Uh, uh, a data week remaining activities and see you next. Thank you.